Good afternoon. On behalf of Ed Steele, Chairman and CEO of EAS Consulting Group, I would like to welcome you to the second in a five-part webinar series on GMP compliance in the Dietary Supplement Laboratory, presented by EAS Senior Director for Dietary Supplement and Tobacco Services, Dr. Tara Lynn Couch. EAS specializes in FDA regulatory matters with a prime focus on assisting domestic and foreign food, pharmaceutical, dietary supplement, medical device, cosmetic, and tobacco firms comply with applicable laws and regulations. EAS is staffed with former FDA compliance and inspection officials and industry executives and is assisted by an extensive network of consultants with many years of FDA and industry experience. Today's webinar is presented by Dr. Tara Lynn Couch. Dr. Couch is a PhD analytical organic chemist with over 25 years of diverse laboratory and regulatory experience in academic, field, contract, and manufacturing environments. She is a sought after expert on issues pertaining to quality control in both pharmaceutical and dietary supplement manufacturing facilities, including the establishment of specifications and the development of well-organized, sophisticated laboratories. Dr. Couch joined EAS as an independent consultant in 2012 and became an independent advisor for dietary supplements in 2017 and recently joined the company full-time as senior director. Over the years, she has assisted numerous dietary supplement companies with the development, improvement, and implementation of strong quality systems that are scientifically sound, efficient, practical, and compliant with all FDA regulations and has performed mock FDA inspections, gap analysis, and contractor facility audits. As a reminder, during the webinar, you may ask any questions of Tara by typing them into the chat box. And with that, I will say thank you again for joining EAS, and I'll turn the presentation over to Tara. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, so this is the second part, as a Amy introduced in our uh, webinar series. Today we're going to talk about laboratory equipment and instrumentation. So just a reminder, we are talking about the laboratory for uh, dietary supplements, um, and the laboratory could be internal or external. And the laboratory is going to provide analytical or microbiological testing of various ingredients in process samples and finished products. Other services that the laboratory may, may provide are analytical method development, verification and validation, microbiological preservative testing and preparatory testing, as well as the storage and or testing of stability samples. So first we're gonna kind of look at some of the various laboratory equipment that you would expect to see. So of course there's going to be glassware in the laboratory. There'll be general equipment such as balances and pipettes. There'll be safety equipment for the laboratory, fumigation hoods, biological safety cabinets, temperature control devices, such as microlab, and if they have this, stability chambers for uh, stability programs. There'll also be a wide variety of physical types of equipment. Um, most common are pH meters, conductivity meters, uh, melt temps, particle size analyzers, et cetera. Laboratory instrumentation um, is also in the laboratory, depending on what the laboratory is doing. So in a microbiological laboratory, they will have autoclaves. Uh, we already talked about incubators. So also have, uh, they can also have automated biosystems. In the chem in, for chemi chemistry, TOCs, or total or organic carbon analyzers, are often found. Uh, this, there are, these are used to test the water at a facility or um, the water in the laboratory itself. There'll also be spectrochemical equipment such as FTIRs, UVBs, AA, ICPs, and we're going to talk about all those um, more specifically later on. There'll also be chromatographic equipment and various types of detectors for all of these types of equipment that we're talking about. So in order to keep track of all these equipment, there needs to be an identification um, assigned to each piece of equipment and instrumentation. And this will sometimes this is referred to as the asset number, um, and sometimes this uh, Sometimes this is there may be two numbers, so there may be a number associated in the laboratory and an asset number for the facility itself. Um, whatever it is, there needs to be a unique identifier for that. Some systems, like a chromatographic system, there'll be multiple parts, and then the system itself will be named as System One or System Two or Fred, whatever. So there will be a number assigned to that. 
So then there's also a, an equipment and instrument list to keep track of all these equipment. This is something that the FDA usually asks for during an audit of a, of a laboratory and a facility is an equipment list. So this should be something that's always uh, readily available. The list will include a description of the equipment, that identification number, numbers that are, are applicable to the t equipment that's there. For each type of equipment or each piece of equipment, there will also be equipment or system logbook. This is uh, used to capture all the maintenance and calibration activities as well as any non-routine operations of the equipment. Some of these things are, are required in accordance to 21 CFR 111. So 111, uh, again, is the current good manufacturing practices in manufacturing, packaging, labeling, or holding operations for dietary supplements. 111.27 is from subpart D, which is equipment and utensils. So in 27A, it says that all equipment must be of appropriate design, construction, and workmanship to enable them to be suitable for their intended use. And then it goes on to say in B that all equipment must be calibrated, and that's before its first use and after that at a frequency that's dictated by the manufacturer to maintain accuracy and precision. In subpart C, it says that equipment controls must be repaired or replaced if they cannot be adjusted and in order to become um, to maintain their calibration. And then in 27D, it says they must be maintained, cleaned, and sanitized as necessary. This is an older slide, which obviously talks about 21 CFR 110, which is the regulation for food. 110 has now been replaced by 117, which is the Food Safety Modernization Act. So this is the HACCP program for that. Um, but just to give you an idea, in one, even in 11040, which is much less, um, much less thorough than 117, it talked about in instruments and controls that had to be calibrated and appropriately maintained. In 21 CFR 211, which are the good manufacturing practices for finished pharmaceuticals, there are also requirements for equipment. And it also talks about having them being suitable and of appropriate design and having appropriate calibrations and maintenance. So this is across the board for all types of GMP regulations. It's not just specific for dietary supplements. So any laboratory that you're using should have appropriate systems for equipment and instrumentation. So the first thing to address the appropriate design, construction, and workmanship, and the suitability for use, is what is referred to as a qualification. So we talked about this, if you were joined us on our, our first uh, webinar, uh, webinar series, uh, we talked about a DQ, IQ, OQ, PQ. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what does that mean. So the DQ, IQ, OQ, PQ is a design qualification, installation qualification, operational qualification, and performance qualification. So this is what is usually used in the laboratory to meet those requirements in 111 or 211 or 117. So this qualification is done uh, usually issuing a protocol. It often can be done by the manufacturer or if you have the appropriate trained personnel, it could be done in-house. Um, and then there'll be a process to explain how this is going to take place in an SOP. So the DQ is done before you have the equipment. So this is, does not um, work for equipment that's already in a laboratory. So this will be newly purchased equipment. So what you're going to do is you're gonna purchase the equipment with a certain set of design qualifications in mind. You want it to meet certain, certain requirements, otherwise you wouldn't be buying this piece of equipment. And you also wanna make sure you have an ROI, a return on investment for this asset purchase. A lot of this equipment is very expensive. So you wanna make sure you're getting the right thing. So you wanna make sure the facility can accommodate the equipment, and if there are changes that need to be made, those are made. So you have to have it a suitable location, you have to have appropriate power um, to, to maintain the equipment. Uh, most equipment also comes with some sort of ancillary equipment that may be purchased that might require water um, or some special types of, of requirements for gases or something. So and ready. Also, you need to have appropriately qualified personnel. Most of this equipment that would have to be qualified is pretty sophisticated and you have to have personnel that know how to operate it. If they don't already, you can send them to training or you can hire new staff that can handle, the, handle this type of equipment. Once you have the equipment, then you have to install it appropriately. So this is the IQ portion. So this is the process of doing that, of installing the, the equipment. So you have to pick the location, um, make sure that the instrument has appropriate clearance. Even something simple like a refrigerator has to have four inch clearance in the back of the refrigerator, depending on the model. 
Um, you have to have temperature and humidity, humidity control in the laboratory to make sure that the instrument can operate in those conditions. I've done a lot of field work and, and believe me, that can sometimes be a challenge. Um, airflow also is important. You don't want to put a piece of equipment directly below uh, an air, uh, air conditioning vent, for example, if it's controlling temperature. Power requirements are also important. Um, so voltage, both the voltage and the amperage. So GCs, for example, gas chromatographs, which we'll talk about later, uh, they usually need to operate at a higher voltage and or higher amperage on those uh, for those because they have to ballistically heat up very quickly. Ancillary equipment and materials such as compressed gases, you'll need the appropriate lines for those gases. And of course, if there's any chillers that are being used, those would require water. Operational qualification is making sure that the, op the, the a piece of instrumentation or equipment actually operates. So this is very simple stuff, making sure it turns on. If it's supposed to cool down, it does that. If it's supposed to heat up, it does that. If it's supposed to rotate, then it does that. It, if there's um, electronic equipment that's supposed to move it up and down, if you've got gases, the gases are flowing. And then if there's software associated the software has been a program thing works. So I always use the example of a refrigerator, right? You open up the refrigerator and did the refrigerator get cold and did the light come on? For a performance qualification, now we're going to get more serious about what the specifications are of that piece of equipment. So not only did it get cold, but what temperature range is it meeting and how variable is that? So we may need to temperature and humidity map this if this is a stability chamber or an incubator or even an oven, a larger oven. You may need to put data loggers throughout the instrument, throughout the uh, equipment and make sure that it meets those requirements throughout the entire unit. If it's something that rotates, the RPMs may have to be determined and calibrated. Um, pump frequency, we need uh, for HPLCs, you have, have to have a certain pump ratio for those things. And the gas flows, we need to make sure not only do they flow, but they flow at the appropriate rate. Injection volumes to make sure that we're injecting the appropriate volume. If we're supposed to be injecting five microliters or are we supposed to be injecting 10 milliliters? We need to make sure that those are calibrated. Analyte detection and quantitation limits are achieved. There are usually certain standards that are used for different types of equipment to demonstrate that we have the appropriate detection limits that we've been able to achieve and the appropriate sensitivity. Um, Software validation is also very, very important. So software has to be compliant with 21 CFR 11, which is electronic records, electronic signatures. And that means there's audit trail documentation and all the mathematical operations that are being performed have been verified to be correct. And then there are authorization, authorization controls in place so that we know who is using the instrument at uh, all times. So to document this DQIQ, OQ, PQ, we would have the instrument, the identification number, and we would then add it to that equipment list that we talked about. We would also create an equipment logbook, we would fix a sticker to that, and then have all the documentation in, in, in a logbook or in a binder usually. Then we'll have to re-qualify the equipment. Um, now, it wouldn't be a DQ because if we've already done the DQ, that won't apply a second time around. But we may need to repeat the requalification if we relocate the equipment or if we upgrade the software, if there's any sort of major repair that's required. Now, if it's a repair to a specific piece of the equipment that's in a larger system, you may not have to requalify the entire system, but just that section or just that piece of equipment or if there's a significant part replaced. So there'll have to be an assessment by an appropriately trained personnel to know what, what has to be repeated of the IQOQPQ process. Then we'll establish quality controls or QCs to ensure that the equipment is properly operating and continues to meet those qualification parameters. So these will have acceptance criteria, a plus or minus, a percent recovery, um, and it will have how often do we have to do this. For analytical instrumentation, there are a lot of different QCs that can be utilized. I've just listed a few of you, a few of them here. System suitability, which is an injection of a standard uh, five times to make sure we have um, the appropriate precision, precision of the instrument before we start to analyze our samples. Uh, the incorporation of blanks, check standards to make sure that our standard is recovering appropriately. 
Drift standards is another one that every so many injections, maybe 10 or 15 injections on a chromatographic piece of equipment, we re-inject a standard and verify that everything is still within control. Um, with the automation that's, that's afforded now with e equipment, there are auto samplers that have 500 locations and they're refrigerated. So you can set up an equipment and it'll run for three days without anybody ever touching it. So you need to make sure operating with appropriate accuracy and precision. So this is why the QCs are utilized. For microbiological uh, QCs, we don't tend to think of those as QCs, but they also have QCs. So positive and negative controls are run with um, each set or positive controls at least periodically. Um, there also is preparatory testing, which is basically a fortification in an analytical world. So we make sure that if there was mold present, we could see it on the matrix that we had. So there are requirements to do that type of testing as well. Then we have the calibration of the equipment. Um, we we kind of talked about that earlier. This is often done during the, the PQ portion of the IQOQPQ. Uh, but if not, there are some equipments that don't necessarily require a qualification. And these are general and physical types of equipment that are calibrated at each time, each time that they're used. So this includes things like balances, pipettes, thermometers, water bath, centrifuges, pH meters, that sort of thing. Um, balances and pipettes. Uh, balances are typically, there's a daily ver weight verification that's done on each piece and each balance, as well as a six month typically or three month type uh, calibration that's done externally. Pipettes are usually calibrated every three months or every six months, but it's a direct measurement that's being made. So as long as that, that um, direct measurement is holding and is within calibration, there's no need to qualify that piece of equipment. And these are equip this is equipment that's generally considered to be mobile. All of those calibration activities will be documented in the equipment logbook uh, and or on a controlled form that can be incorporated into a logbook. And then a calibration sticker would be affixed to the piece of instrumentation or equipment to demonstrate that the calibration was done, who it was done by, when it was done, and what the next calibration due date is. So this is a, a requirement in 111 is the piece of equipment indicates that to the analyst or the microbiologist in the laboratory that yes, I'm using a piece of equipment that is appropriately appropriate and suitable for use. Once we've done all this work to qualify and calibrate it, we have to make sure and maintain the equipment. So this is typically called a PM system or a PM program. And this is conducted for all equipment and instrumentation to verify that we are, that we are going to be able to hold the qualification and calibration. So this is often done for more sophisticated equipment. This is often done by third-party vendors um, that will come in and, qualify and, and do PMs on all of your uh, HPLCs, for example. Um, but you can do it in-house if you have appropriately trained personnel. So this is a system you have to be tracking all those um, all those doc all those time periods that are dictated in the SOPs that we have to do this on three months or six months or annually, whatever the requirement is, somebody has to keep track of that. And that's typically in this PM program to make sure that those things are being done. Now, certainly analysts and microbiologists, every time they use a piece of equipment, they should be looking at that and verifying that that, oh yeah, it's in, it's in, it's in calibration so I can continue to use it. But you don't want it to say, oh, it's not, I can't use it today, and then they can't do that analysis. So you want to have a PM program that's monitoring that. So this can be very simple, such as some sort of a, a list that's provided in Excel or some sort of access database, or it can be sophisticated software. There's a lot of sophisticated uh, um, software systems that are available to organize your PM program that'll send you emails when stuff is due and everything. There'll also be an SOP, which I just alluded to and alluded to earlier, that would describe the operation and use of the equipment. So this um, would also have that qualification requirement like we just talked about. It would have what the QCs are, what the calibration requirements are, and how often what the PMs are, so what cleaning regimens need to be undertaken, um, and maintenance operations need to be undertaken. And all of this will be documented in the equipment logbook or, and or in a controlled form that would be put into a book. 
So there's a lot of work that's being done here on the equipment. So the personnel that are doing that have to have the appropriate education, training, and experience to, to do that. So if they're assigned to do these, these functions, then they need to have the appropriate training. So this is, in fact, a requirement of 21 CFR 111.12c about personnel in subpart B. So you'll need to have a job description that says, what are the assigned job functions? So am I doing qualifications of HPLCs? Then I need to have the appropriate education training experience to do that. So there'll be the experience that I have prior to coming into the laboratory. So that will be either on your CV or a resume, or you can create a bio. That would be a summary of those things. And then all the on-the-job training that was done. So this could also be courses that were attended, um, equipment and instrumentation use, SOPs, training on the test methods that demonstrate how to operate this equipment. All of that would have to be in that person's training record to document that they're, they can, in fact, perform these operations. So we have lots of different types of equipment that can be used. So selecting the appropriate piece of equipment is very important. <clears throat> so it has to be suitable for its intended use. So uh, FTIR, for example, um, got, has gotten a really bad rap in the last few years. And that's not because FTI, FTIR isn't a, an awesome technique. It was used outside of its intended use. And so the FDA came after that in 2013 and 2014, where people were identifying, trying to identify botanicals and blends with an IR. That's not an appropriate use of the IR. But using IR in a different capacity with pure ingredients is, is wonderful. It's done in So I like to use the quote from Albert Einstein, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not one bit simpler. So we want to try to use the least sophisticated equipment if it does what we need it to do. So first, you typically want to look at physical types of measurements. Um, microbiological testing might be the way to go, and that could be the beneficial way to, to, way to do the test. Or you may have to go to sophisticated analytical instrumentation. It gets, affords you the selectivity and the sensitivity necessary to meet specifications. So we're going to go through a few different types of equipment that you will typically see um, in an analytical laboratory. So one of those would be UV vis. This is a, a technique where monochromatic light is used to obtain a spectra of the absorption of the sample. So it, UV is between 190 and 390 nanometers, and visible spectrum is, be, is 390 to 750. And what you do is you take a scan and get the spectra of your sample, and then you compare it to a reference library of a known standard that's already been characterized. FTIR, like we talked about, that's Fourier Transfer Infrared Spectrometry. This is a technique that uses polychromatic light, so multiple um, light ranges with a laser beam, and then there are mirrors that focus to obtain an, what's called an interferogram of the absorption of the sample. And then that's mathematically transformed into what we see as an IR spectrum. So there are a couple of different ranges where that can be done. Uh, most common um, is the mid-infrared, which is 4,000 to 650 inverse centimeters, versus the near, which has also become more popular recently, um, which is beyond that, 4,000 to 12,500. So again, we do a spectra, we obtain this spectra, and then we compare it to a reference material library. So there are commercial libraries that are available for something like 250,000 different types of materials that you raise in-house. The key is that that reference material has to be characterized ahead of time to make sure it's, the, it's appropriately identified. So as I was saying, IR has been abused uh, in the dietary supplement industry and used outside of its appropriate design. So uh, it's used for an organic samples because what it's looking for is it's looking for the stretching and the movement between different bonds and different functional groups. So those don't exist in minerals. So the IR is, does not work for minerals. So you get no meaningful spectra at all. So you can't do like a Sodium, carbon, uh, um, sodium chloride, for example. You're, not get, you're just going to get one flat line. It also doesn't work well for complex, uh, um, complex types of materials. It works best for high purity materials. That's because there are, is, there are so many different functional groups that would be present from all the different components in the, in the material that you 
really get no meaningful information. So it's not applicable to botanical ingredients and it's not applicable for, to blended materials. So there was a big push to try to do FTIR for dietary supplement products and it just doesn't work in, in complex dietary supplement products alone. There are some uh, manipul computer manipulations that can be done to, to try to simplify this a little bit, but alone FTIR can't do that. So then we have thin layer chromatography or TLC. This is a simple chromatographic technique um, which uses low volatility compounds that you spot them. Um, if you've ever been in a chemistry lab, a lot of people have done this. So you basically have a silica plate, you put a little pencil dot on there and then you have a solvent and you let the solvent move up by capillary action and it travels with that little spot and separates out the different chemicals that would be present. So that's a thin layer chromatography. The more sophisticated way to do that is to have a much thicker layer of silica and and that's called high performance. Same principle, um, but because of the, the uh, precision with the spot and the precision with the moving, then you get um, much, better, um, much better performance for accuracy and precision using HPTLC. So this can be done in either a qualitative or a quantitative way. So you can actually, you can actually cut out that spot and weigh it and measure that and that can be a way to determine concentration but of course if you're doing HPTLC there are other methods of doing that to determine the density of the color of the spot. So there are also commercial TLC libraries available or you can de develop your own TLC libraries but again the key is to make sure that that reference material or that botanical reference material has been appropriately characterized. It's also very important using HPLT, HPTLC that if you're using a botanical uh, plant plant and you're using a powder versus an extract, you have to make sure that this reference material is the same. So the a powdered material cannot be used as reference material for an extract because they're not going to have this go, have gone through the same process. So then we get to chromatography. So first we have liquid chromatography. Um, most people are familiar with HPLC, which is high performance liquid chromatography. This is a chromatographic technique where you take non-volatile um, liquid compounds, that's why it's called liquid chromatography, and you eject it onto a column of, column of an absorb, absorbent stationary phase. And then you push it through with another liquid and they're separated by their affinity from one phase to another. So the two phases are different. Um, my chromatography uh, instructor that I first had, he, he akin this to a drunken sailor walking through the streets of London and starting it, stopping at various pubs that he liked. <laughs> Ultra high pressure liquid chromatography is the same principle, but just kind of like the, the we have a thicker uh, stationary phase, and so we have to have higher pressure to push it through that phase, but it's the exact same principle. There can be a variety of different detection systems that are used on an HPLC or a UPLC. It can be the UV vis that we talked about before. It can also be fluorescence. So after you excite a molecule, how it, how it releases that energy through light. Or it can be by mass, and this is called mass spectrometry. Gas chromatography is the same technique uh, as liquid chromatography, except um, the 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 phase that is pushing through is a gas. So this only applies to volatile liquids or liquids that can be rapidly heated and moved into the gas phase. So again, you inject a solution and then it's, it's heated uh, very quickly, goes into the gas phase, the gas travels over the stationary phase and that affinity for one phase or the another is what separates the different chemicals from each other. So uh, there are various tech de detection systems that can be used for GC. Um, you can see, you barely see on the bottom there, you can separate them by mass using mass spectrometry, but there are a variety of other types of GC uh, detectors that sometimes get forgotten about. So a flame ionization detector, an FID, will detect all carbon compounds, so anything that's organic. A TCD or thermal conductivity will detect any gas going through, it was just any change in the gas phase uh, flow. And then there are specific types that are used in uh, environmental labs. So there's an NPD, which is a nitrogen phosphate detector, which is specific for pesticide analysis, very selective. And we also have an electron capture detector, or ECD, which is good for electronegative compound, negative atoms, such as uh, bromine and chlorine, which are often also found in pesticides. So you can really specialize the detection and, and increase the sensitivity by picking the appropriate detector.
spray. Um, so AA is atomic absorption. So basically here you heat up a, a liquid sample in a flame that gets to a, approximately 2500 degrees C and the samples are atomized and then you detect them in that fashion. This works for some 70 some odd different elements. I've just listed a few here that we commonly see in the dietary supplements. And then ICP is the same sort of technique, but instead of using a flame, we use a plasma. And so that gets much, much, ho much, much hotter. So um, over 5,000 degrees Celsius. So that plasma then heats up those samples. And because, of, because you've removed a lot of the background, it's so high um, that you have much better sensitivity for the minerals and metals. So this is really great for um, trace analysis of heavy metals. So especially ICP mass spec when those things are put together. So those will uh, can do arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and le mercury and lead. An OES um, or an AES atomic emission spectrometer detects the emission from analyte energy. So we're doing all using all this equipment because we have to meet certain testing requirements in the rate according to the dietary supplement regulation. So 11170 talks about the specifications that we must have and they must hit we must address identity purity strength composition and limits on potential contaminants. In 11175 it says we have to verify that those specifications are met and that's where the testing comes into play. So a single test can be used for each one of these or you may have to have a combination to do the testing specifically for identity. Um, one test could also apply to more than one category. So the way that you choose your testing uh, should be done with a scientifically sound background. So for identification, the tests or tests that are chosen must unequivocally received at the facility. So we have to be able to say, this is this, this is Tara. Um, so you can do this in a variety of different ways. Appearance obviously is something that you would look at, but appearance alone is probably not gonna work. So most of the um, raw materials that we receive are white powders. So a description of a white powder is not gonna work. It's not gonna unequivocally delineate it from something else. You can also do organoleptic analysis, which typically includes color, taste, or odor, some sort of sensory evaluation. Particle type and size, if it's a beadlet, for example, versus a powder, uh, versus a crystalline form, this can be done visually or with a particle size analyzer. Other physical attributes can also be important, especially for minerals melt temps. You can take the actual melt temp of that um, material, or you can assess the density of the material. There can also be other wet chemical tests, such as colorimetric, potentiometric, precipitation, or titrometric that can be used. And these are particularly applicable to minerals or mineral salts um, with specific functional groups. Then we get to purity. So the definition I use for purity is from the World Health Organization, which is microbiological purity. So there are other types of purity that we can also discuss too. But first to talk about microbiological purity. So we're basically gonna look for any sort of bacteria, yeast or molds that shouldn't be there in the material. And then potentially any objectionable organisms as well. So to do this, there's a variety of different microbiological techniques that can be used. You can use the auger plate methods, petri film uh, methods. There are rapid test kits for Salmonella 1-2, for example. And then there are also uh, um, more sophisticated equipment for microbiological analyzers that can be used. You can also assess for something like chromatographic purity to make sure that you don't have any other um, organic compounds that would be present is where we usually have to bring out our analytical instrumentation. Um, so what you have to do for strength is to demonstrate that we're going to meet what the claim is on the supplement facts panel of the dietary supplement product label. This is the same for foods, it's the same for, for uh, pharmaceuticals. You have to make sure that you're going to meet that label claim. So for vitamins, typically what we're going to be using is chromatography. So depending on whether it's a volatile um, ingredient or not, so that would be GC versus HPLC. For our minerals, uh, we can do AA or ICP depending on what we're trying to accomplish. So if we're looking for our trace um, amounts of something that are the low level minerals, for example, a, a molly, uh, molybdenum, then we want, may want to do ICP over AA because we have more sensitivity. 
we may for our, our botanical ingredients, um, we would usually apply HPTLC. And if we're specifically looking for one of those chemical constituents or biomarkers that are present in that botanical, then we may have to do HPLC and do a chromatographic analysis of that. The amino acids, if we're claiming the amino acids profile, then those are also done typically using HPLC. Um, and enzymes are also analyzed using HPLC. For composition, this tends to be the physical parameters that are being assessed. Um, so this is your balances for weight and weight variation. It's also physical types of tests, um, pH if you're talking about a liquid, um, or, or particle size analysis if you're talking about powders. You can also look at density if you're talking about powders. Um, moisture content can be very important. Uh, water activity or um, loss on drying or Carl Fisher moisture analyzer. Um, for tablet and capsules and soft gels, disintegration and or dissolution may also be applicable. So you want to make sure that you haven't make a rock that passes. To make sure that when you, uh, when you ship a tablet that it's not broken in pieces by the time the consumer receives it. Then we get to the contaminants. So this is where us analytical chemists have the most fun because then we get to use all this sophisticated equipment. So heavy metals are ubiquitously found in the environment and uh, they impact human health due to their toxicity and physiological effects, even at very low exposure levels. Most of us are familiar with Prop 65. Prop 65 is California's Environmental Protection Agency um, Environmental Hazard Health Hazard Assessment Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act that actually was issued in 1986. So it's been around for a very long time. Um, what it does is specifically call out, there's, there's actually like 180 chemicals that they list in Prop 65. The four that we hear most about are arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead. And lead in particular, the Prop 65 requirement, if you're shipping into the state of California, you have to meet 0.5 micrograms per day of lead. So it's not in a concentration unit, it's in a dosage unit. And so that is the lowest level in the world for, for lead. Uh, the only other place that um, is lower than that is Canada for children. Any products that go to children has to be 0.3 micrograms per day. So it's very low, it's very low. So we have to bring out the big instrument in instrumentation to do that. So that's ICPMS um, to meet the sensitivity requirements that are necessary for that. Another contaminant that we have in the, in the dietary supplement world are from our botanicals. So pesticides are going to potentially be there. Um, so we have to make sure that we're assessing our um, products for that. And that isn't to say that the actual raw material that we um, sourced was sprayed with pesticides. Pesticides like heavy metals are ubiquitously present because they can be uh, um, or retain from a previous, re previous crop that was um, grown there. So we have to make sure that we're looking for those. So the EPA is the one that regulates pesticides in the US. And um, in the USP, the United States Pharmacopeia, they list, I think the current list is 70 uh, pesticides that are um, in the USP. This has bounced back and forth a few times, uh, but they defer also to the EPA for what those levels should be. But there are contract laboratories that actually have methods that do upwards of 300 different pesticides and will analyze for those. So the test that you're going to employ, whether you're going to be looking for one specific pesticide, which you know um, was sprayed there or on a nearby plant um, or near, nearby field, or whether you're doing a wide swath and looking for a wide swath of pesticides, depends on where the material is going to come from. So. Um, Materials that come from China in particular tend to have a lot more pesticides. They do not have the regulations that we do uh, in the US. And um, some third world countries also have pesticides that haven't been used in, in use in the United States since 1974. So you have to make sure you're looking for the appropriate pesticides. So in order to do this, these are usually very low levels and there's usually potentially lots of them. If we're looking for 300 different pesticides, obviously we need some sophisticated instrumentation to do that. And in fact, what's usually, do what's usually done is a combination of equipment. So we would use an HPLC with two mass specs, a triple quad, 
a GC mass spec or a GC with two mass specs on it. We can also do NPD, like I talked about for pesticide analysis or ECD when we're looking for those. And oftentimes what you'll see is a combination of those different techniques being used to determine all 100 or 300 of these pesticides if you're doing the full screen. Another contaminant to consider in botanical extracts is residual solvents is and how clean those chemicals were. were. Most, most of the time we think of an ethanolic extraction, so you'd want to evaluate for ethanol, um, but how clean was the ethanol that was utilized? There might be other chemicals that were present in that ethanol, so you may want to look for, for that. So, and then there are still, I, I just a couple months ago uh, worked with a client that they were actually uh, had um, had a company that was extracting with hexane. So, so these chemicals are still being utilized. So you want to make sure that you're assessing for the residual amounts of that if those types of chemicals are being used. So these are volatile um, compounds. So these are usually done by GC, either with the GC FID or a mass spec. Melamine is an economically adulterated contaminant. It's actually plastic. I have melamine plates that I use when I um, have a dinner outside. Um, melamine can damage re will damage renal cells and cause kidney malfunction. There has been multiple cases of known economic adulteration of melamine to mimic protein content. So this has been done. There were uh, this was done in China initially. And there were a number of infant deaths and some 10,000 children that were sickened in China. And then back in 2009, 10, this was attributed to a variety of cat and dog deaths in the United States. And then I also recall that it was in, it was found in chocolate in Costco because that year I, uh, it was around Halloween and that year I didn't let my children eat any chocolate. So the FDA came out with a guidance for industry called pharmaceutical components at risk for melamine contamination back in August of 2009. And that specified a level of less than 2.5 ppm melamine as being not contaminated. So we have to have a test method for those. So all anything that would contain an amine or high concentrations of proteins should be assessed to make sure they do not contain melamine. And this can be done by a variety of techniques, um, chromat chromatographic te techniques with different detectors on them. Celiac disease is caused by an inflammatory reaction to gliadin, which is the gluten protein that's found in wheat and some other crops that are similar, like barley and rye. There's also been uh, con known contamination, cross-contamination of uh, different other types of materials that wouldn't, you wouldn't anticipate to have gluten in them. So because this can be done at the distrib distributor, this could happen at the farm. Um, so there are also requirements that if, if you could have overlap of gluten when you wouldn't anticipate that. For people that have celiac disease, um, the only thing they can do is not have gluten. So um, only 1% of the population actually has celiac disease in the United States. However, this has become kind of a diet fad in the United States. So a lot of companies have entire gluten-free um, lines of products. So if you're claiming that the product is gluten-free, then you have to test it, make sure it doesn't contain gluten. So the way to do that is with an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay or an ELISA method. So this is a wet chemical technique that uses antibodies and color changes to identify a substance, and it's done on a 96 well plate. So in summary, you have to use the appropriate type of analytical instrumentation in, order, in your quality control lab. You have to make sure that it, that laboratory is, is appropriately tracking that equipment. They've qualified that equipment with the DQIQ, OQPQ before using it. Uh, they've established quality controls to make sure that the equipment is following, is meeting its accuracy and precision requirements. It's been calibrated before its use, first use and at the frequency necessary. It's been appropriately maintained. And there are SOPs that dictate how all of that happens and how the instrument is utilized. And we're using, and only trained personnel are, are utilized to meet the sensitivity and selectivity requirements of our specification that we have to have in accordance to 21 CFR 11170. And it has to be an appropriate test that's employed. All right, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take a few questions here. We have a few minutes. Thank you, Tara, I appreciate that. We do have a few questions that have come in. 
Uh, the first is, what would be a calibration procedure for a compound microscope? A compound microscope, that's a good one. Um, <clears throat> I would actually have to defer, I'm not a microbiologist by training, so I would have to defer to the um, instrument manual. So that's usually the first place to go to find out what calibration criteria you should use for any piece of equipment. So a scope, um, I, I believe there are standards that you use to make sure that you're looking at the right um, measurement. If it's a 1 to 1,000 or 1 to 10,000 or 300 or whatever, there are certain um, slides that they have that you can use to verify that you're using the right um, uh, measurement for that. So that would probably be all I would imagine that would be happening on a, a calibration of a microscope. But again, I would defer to the um, manual for that particular scope and model to know what exactly they re the manufacturer recommends that you do. So the next question is a follow-on, but uh, I'll ask it anyway, just in case. Uh, the, the question is, are DQ, IQ, OQ, PQ for required for a compound microscope? And if so, how would this be documented? Probably not, because a scope is something that you usually would, would move around. And um, so I, I wouldn't expect that you would have to do um, a DQ, IQ, IQ, OQ, PQ on that. Now, doing a DQ would still be smart, because you would still want to make sure that you're, you're getting the right um, scope to make sure that you have the right um, uh, magnifying that you need um, for the scope. So you could do a DQ, but it typically is something that you can move around the laboratory. And um, typically when it's something that you can move around the laboratory, an IQ, OQ, PQ isn't necessary. So, but again, I would defer to the menu, the manual from the manufacturer. There may be some specific um, IQ requirements for, for the bench location of, of the scope. So you may have to um, I'm not sure what that those might be, but uh, but there may be some that would be uh, dictated in this in the manual. Next question is FTIR for OTC products okay? For OTC, it it's the same. It applies to the. Doesn't matter what um, type of uh, commodity it is, whether it's a food or a dietary supplement or a, or an OTC. It just matters what the material is. So if the material is the OTC material is um, pure enough and it's organic, then yeah, and you have a standard that has been put into the library, absolutely. So um, I come from a pharma background as well in in the laboratory, and we use IR all the time. Our next question is, uh, which pesticide should I have specs for? That, again, depends on your material. So um, what you want to do is get as much information from your supplier of that material that you can. So you know where you certainly want the country of origin of that material. Uh, if you know that that material is treated with specific types of chemicals, those are the ones you would certainly want to have on your list. If you really don't know and aren't getting very much information but from your suppliers, and unfortunately that often happens, then I would recommend doing the screen. So you can do the uh, USP, the USP chapter, uh, I think it's 460, no, 467, I can't remember. So the, um, the, the, screen, the screen that they have for, I think it's 70 right now, that would be a good start. If you don't know anything about what pesticides would be there, that's where I would start. Um, however, uh, methyl bromide is something that if your product is coming from China, that uh, wasn't, isn't on the list for in the USP, and that is certainly something that you need to use, need to look at if you're um, getting materials from China, because they use that very, very liberally in China. There's even been reports of they'll have a feel that this goes to the US and this is what we have, because the one with the US is just doused with methylene bromide. So you want to make sure that um, you you get as much information from the raw material supplier as you can. Um, on the material and do your own research too on the material and what's used. So there is a lot of information out there by um, a, a great botanical resources, APA, the American Herbal Products Association. They know a lot about those materials. Uh, so does the American Botanical, Co botanical Council, ABC. So, so um, I would look at some of them, uh, some of the resources that they would have to get an idea of what pesticides could be present. And what criteria is the USP list based on? 
Well, you have to ask USP that. I've had this discussion with them a couple of times, in fact, <laughs> because it's changed a few times. And and as I just mentioned, you know, methyl methylene bromide, bromide wasn't on the list. So um, because it's a compendial, um, re it's an excellent resource. But because it's compendial, sometimes it they can't be. Um, as current as they'd like to be. So they try to be very current and, and make revisions, but it's a process that has to take place. So you want to make sure that you're looking at uh, trade organizations too to you know determine what pesticides you should be looking at. Um, so I, I would say that their list generally is what types of, of organic materials might be are well known. And they did work with the EPA on what those chemicals are, but if you're familiar with the EPA at all, there are tens of thousands of pesticides that are actually in use and listed with the EPA. So we're not going to test for tens of thousands. So the, the USP dwindled that down to that list of 70 based on what they would consider high risk. But I do believe that was in, from the US, and that's why something like methylene bromide didn't get brought over to that list. Do you need photographic proof? Sorry, the um, question is. It's on a skinny line here. Do you need photographic proof of a result for positive ID using a microscope in the dietary supplement GMP industry? It depends on how your SOP would be written. Um, I mean, that'd be great. I mean, now you can take the, the picture. Most a lot of those scopes have that they can just take the picture for you and that would be unequivocal proof. So I would highly recommend that you do that. Um, however, if you have it built into your SOP and you would have those pictures in your SOP and your analyst was trained appropriately on that SOP and was looking for certain types of things in the scope, um, in the plant part itself, if they were looking for certain things and certain distances and that sort of stuff, if those are recorded, then you wouldn't necessarily have to take a picture of, of each raw material that you looked at. Do manufacturing companies need to document everything digitally? We write documentation and keep it in binders. You can do it manually or electronically. And usually what, what I see is, and what's probably most common is a combination of both, right? So some systems are manual, some systems are electronic. So um, most of us know how to do the manual system and know how to follow good documentation practices when we generate manual records electronic records, and those records then have to comply with 21 CFR 11, which is electronic records, electronic signatures. And so you have to validate that equipment going through a process like we talked about, the DQ, IQ, OQ, PQ. And that can be very expensive, and that can be um, often is not something that the laboratory has expertise to do in-house, and you have to hire a third party to do it. Um, so it can take a lot of time. It can be very expensive. So some people, even if they have digital capability or electronic capability, they actually take it offline because that's an easier way to meet the requirement, not have to comply with, with part 11. And you're just using that as a tool, Excel, for example. So usually it's a combination of both. So there is certainly no requirement to do everything digitally. That's entirely up to you. I have seen laboratories that are incredibly efficient that are strictly manual. And then I've seen um, laboratories that are digital, that are very man very um, efficient as well, and then everything in between. <laughs> so it really depends on the expertise that you have in the laboratory and the types of equipment that you have in the laboratory. And would you talk about uh, the Petri film method for product release and how it should be described in the COA? Well, on your C of A, you would have to have um, the specific test method that's utilized. So you don't want to just say Petri film. You would have to say list, if you're, you're referring to one of the AOAC methods, for example, you would have to list that specific uh, test method on there, that this is the method that you're following. If it's an in-house procedure that you have, then you would want to write your SOP number there. And you would say it's a Petri film, SOP, blah, blah. And you would you would ish, say, state what that method is. So there has, every method that's used has to be scientifically valid and it has to have, has to be um, a risk to uh, comply. So in order to be scientifically valid, and we'll talk about scientific validity of test methods in another session um, in more detail, but it has to be, be accurate, precise, 
rugged and um, specific for your sample. So you have to make sure it's appropriate. So petri film may or may not meet those requirements for some of the some samples. So you have to have some data to support that and this would be some of that preparatory testing data that we were talking about with your quality controls for micro. Um, you would have to have some data to support that though that test method, the, the petri film test method is appropriate for that particular sample. But it certainly could be. It depends on the matrix. All right. Thank you. I think that concludes our questions. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Our third in the series uh, for the Dietary Supplement Webinar uh, GNP Compliance Lab is October 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and the topic will be scientifically valid methods. So you are welcome to register for that if you haven't already by visiting EASConsultingGroup.com. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you.